Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized them with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Lord has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him, out of their sight. And while he looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like like manner you saw him go into heaven. Our epistle lesson is found in Ephesians Chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, and that's found on page 1,661 in the Pew Bible. Our text this morning is the beginning of the second volume of a history written by Luke, the physician. Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, he gives us carefully researched Uh, history of Jesus' life, of the ministry that he went about and the interactions he had with his his apostles, his disciples, and with the public. And it begins in a very similar way as as the book of Acts does. It mentions this this man, Theophilus. And I was just thinking about this, that if you break the name of Theophilus down, what it means is it means the brother of God or friend of God. But I think brother of God is a really interesting translation because Jesus calls those who believe in him his brother. But this is Luke's second book as we begin uh, the book of Acts here in chapter 1 verse 1. And it's here where he continues to tell of the things that Jesus did, uh, but now the things that he's doing through the actions, the acts of his apostles. The first 11 verses of this book serve as a sort of prologue. It sets the tone for the entire book. It sets up everything that's going to happen, really, in these first 11 verses. Jesus' ministry while walking around on earth is, is done. He's ascending to heaven, and now he's giving this work to his disciples. And we often might ask, well, what's he doing now? Well, he's, he's reigning and ruling as good kings do. And so as we look at the first three verses, we see that Jesus' work is done. That Jesus' purpose of putting on human flesh and becoming fully man while remaining fully God at the same time was to lay down his life for you. Jesus' life and ministry was the breaking through of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of darkness. Through his miracles and his healings and through his teaching those who witnessed and received saw a foretaste of the new heavens and the new earth which God was establishing through Jesus and that he is even establishing now through the work of his disciples as Christians go throughout their day meditating on God's word and sharing that word with one another and with their neighbors. Jesus' death is the atoning sacrifice of the only righteous one. He's the righteous one who lays down his life for the sake of all the unrighteous. Through his death, 
your account of sin and the punishments that, that accompany them are wiped away and you're given the perfect account of Jesus Christ. Jesus then descends into hell as we read in 1 Peter 3 and as we confess in our Apostles' Creed and there he declares victory over all evil, including the devil himself. And then Jesus rises from the dead and this is his victory over death and the proclamation of eternal life, which is yours through faith in him. Death entered the world through sin through, of one man, And eternal life now is given to all men through Jesus Christ for those who believe. After Jesus' resurrection then, he spent 40 days. And if you're really fast at math, you go, that's not today, that was Thursday, but we're doing it today anyway. 40 days with his disciples, and he wasn't with them every moment. He was there for a while, and then he would disappear. He would walk through a door and he would have a meal with them and they would be talking and he'd be teaching and then he would just walk away and he'd be gone. He, but he would sit and he would have meals with them and he would teach them and he would walk with them along the shores of Galilee and they'd go fishing together and these sorts of things. The purpose of these times together was to do primarily two things. First was to show his disciples that he wasn't an apparition, that he was really there. He really did rise from the dead. They weren't just seeing things or maybe having some type of of hallucination, but that he was there in the flesh with them. That's why he was eating. That's why they would reach out and they would touch him, like, like Thomas we read about in the Gospels. And so what we see is Jesus here is giving them verifiable proofs that they can know that he has been bodily resurrected from the dead. He could do all sorts of miraculous things. But this was obviously then no problem because that's what he had always been doing. He was the God of the universe and is the God of the universe. Second thing that he's doing here is he's speaking with them about the kingdom of God. We tend to think of kingdom often as a noun, and, and we can point then to a kingdom on a map, and we can say, well, you know, like King Charles III, right? He was just crowned King Charles III, and you point at the map and say, that's his kingdom, right? The idea of a kingdom, though, is, is not best described as like a noun, as something that you point to on the map. It's best defined as an action. It's an, one of those action nouns. A kingdom is wherever the king is reigning and ruling as king. And, and so a kingdom in this type of an idea of, of an action is really wherever the king is doing kingly things. And the kingly things that Jesus does as king of kings and lord of lords is he grants grace to sinners through the means which he has decided through word and sacrament. Therefore, he reigns in his kingdom of grace whenever and wherever the gospel is preached. And because we believe the gospel being preached and proclaimed is a means of grace that God uses to bring about the redemption and grant eternal life to wayward sinners, and we believe that God reigns through this preaching of the gospel, we could therefore say that this right now is the kingdom of God. But not fully, obviously. It's a foretaste. The congregation, when it gathers together around God's word, is receiving God's gifts, the gifts that he has won in his victory over sin, death, and the devil. He gives to you. He gives you faith. He gives you the forgiveness of sins. He gives you eternal life. He reveals his divine election, which he accomplished before the foundations of the earth. Those, that election is revealed in the congregation as you hear the words of Christ proclaimed and as you believe, it means that, that this, is, this isn't just a social gathering. It's not just a time to get together and talk about the weather, although obviously we're going to do that. But it's a time when we come together as God's people, as the people who have participated in his victory over sin. And we've received all of the benefits of that victory. And it's here then where he gives us not only forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ, But it's here also then where he gives his comfort. He grants us joy. He shows us hope. 
He gives us love for one another and for him and where he gives the Holy Spirit. His work is accomplished. Jesus' work on earth is accomplished and our work begins now. Now, before Jesus ascends into his heavenly throne, he reminds the disciples of the work he has already given them to do. This work is not to contribute to their own salvation. That work was Jesus' work, and he's accomplished it. It's done. The work of the disciples now is to be the witnesses of Christ to the world. To this end, he tells them to remain in Jerusalem until they receive the promise which he had promised them, which is the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, Jesus says, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this sometimes is misunderstood. What is Jesus exactly talking about here? And we want to be careful not to disparage what John was doing, and sometimes that's how it's read. And what do I mean by that? It means... I, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. He's, he speaks well of John throughout his ministry. He even, he, we know he approved of John's ministry and said this is a good thing because he went there and was baptized by John. So, so I don't think that we can say anything negative about what John is, is being mentioned here. John's ministry was a ministry of baptism of repentance. That baptism and repentance was not symbolic. It was a conversion through the preaching of the word, just as baptism is now. We can understand this verse to say then that John baptized with water. God be praised. Just as John applied water on people, you now will apply the Holy Spirit to people. That's the ministry that God has called his disciples to. The disciples, though, they ask a question. They understand things must, time must be getting short here. And so they ask Jesus about how, uh, oh, excuse me, they ask Jesus about when he's going to establish the kingdom. They don't ask how the kingdom will be restored. The kingdom of grace is, is established through the preaching of the gospel. We've, he's already talked about this. He's to, or taught the disciples about this. To see how the kingdom is restored, all you have to do is keep turning through this page, the pages of the book of Acts. And you're going to see everything about how God is going to restore his kingdom. It's right there. And if you look even farther, you can look into Romans 11, uh, verse 11, where you learn about how God establishes his kingdom in the same way that uh, someone would cultivate a, a vine. You take off the vines that don't produce and the branches that don't produce, and you graft in new ones. This is how God is going to establish his kingdom. You can also look at Galatians 3 and 4 and see how Jesus is the promised seed from the garden and how those who believe in him through faith, are descendants of Abraham. They're descendants through the promise, the same way Isaac was, in the same way, well, and in not the same way that Ishmael was, who was the firstborn. Jesus answers another question, though, about where. Where is this kingdom going to be established? He says it's going to start in Jerusalem, and then it's going to go to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And it's like a bullseye. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But those, not all those questions are being asked here. The question here is about timing. Will you at this time restore the kingdom, the disciples ask? The common idea at the time was that God would restore a physical kingdom, and we've talked about that before. And, uh, and it would be a little surprising, I think, if this was what the disciples were thinking but the disciples have surprised us many times, and they will continue to surprise us. For instance, it's a, it's a surprise to Peter when he finds out, oh, the kingdom of God is for the Gentiles also. He, he doesn't come fully aware of that until later on in the book of Acts. And so we can't rule that out, that, that they're asking about, well, hey, is this going to happen now, this physical kingdom? But Jesus said very clearly, my kingdom is not of this world when he stood before Pilate. The restoration of the kingdom in an ordinary, ordinary earthly manner is ultimately not what Jesus has come to do. Jesus' answer is to show how, not to answer when. He says, the timing is not for you to know. What is for you to know is to receive the promise and to be my witnesses. 
That is why the emphasis of Jesus' answer is on what naturally follows after the disciples receive the Holy Spirit. They will be Jesus' witnesses to the world. The natural result of coming to faith in Jesus is that this will be a description of who you are. That for those who believe in Jesus Christ, they will be able to do nothing but to tell people about it. They will be able to do nothing but go forward and, and live their life in a new light because they are now children of the light. The natural result of believing in Jesus is that, is that you're going to tell people about it. And this starts in the home, certainly. And this is actually, I didn't even think, this is a great tie-in for Mother's Day, right? This starts in the home. Mothers, the primary way how you witness to Christ is through your kids. And dads is the same way. And it's also through your wife, right? And, th- and, then, and then it goes out from there that there's, there's circles that we run in and it just goes out from the home. From the home you go to church and we witness to one another. And then from church we go into our lives in the world and, and our jobs and, and our friends and the various circles we run with, with swim team or with their cross country team or, or maybe it's, it's uh, a few guys down at the elevator. I don't know. There's, everybody has circles that you run in. And, and we are called to be witnesses in these circles. This isn't a command that comes out of some moral compulsion that God's really going to really stick his finger down on. He's like, you need to witness more. It's not the point. The point is it's a promise. The promise is that you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be Jesus' witnesses. Verses 9 through 11 then we find that question, or kind of the answer to the question of, well, what's, what's Jesus doing now? If he's going up into heaven, up into the sky, what's, what's he doing now? Well, we, what we see is a, a very vivid description of what happens. Jesus is carried up into the sky, and then a cloud comes underneath him. It's like the cloud receives him, as some translations say. Jesus is out of the disciples' sight. And he's not going to come back the way how he has. During these 40 days, he would appear and then he'd disappear and then he'd come back and then he'd disappear again. No more of that. Jesus is going to go away to prepare the place for him just as he promised. Jesus would not walk with them and eat with them in the same way as he had done before. Jesus bodily ascended to the right hand of God to, in the, and is seated on the throne in the heavenly places, as it said in our reading in, in Ephesians. And then along come these two men dressed in white, and, and it's, these, are, these are angels. We, we, we can see this very clearly. Angels have always accompanied Jesus throughout his ministry. Jesus' birth was announced by angels beforehand. When he was then finally born of Mary, angels were there announcing his birth again. His ministry was accompanied by angels. Think of his temptation in the desert. And there was all the talk of, of like, throw yourself down and angels will come. And Jesus says, no, you're not going to put God to the test. But then what happens right after that is angels come and they care for Jesus. And then, and then later on, we see Jesus and his resurrection, that there's angels that are there. And so here at his ascension, it would make sense that there's angels and these two who are, are dressed in white fit the description very, very well. They come with a message, because that's what angels do. The word angelos, or angel in Greek, it literally means a messenger. And so these angels come with a message from God, and they immediately bring the disciples back to earth. They're, up, they're staring up into the heavens, and they say, Hey, men of Galilee! How more earthly can you get than being saying, hey, aren't you from Canova, right? That type of an idea. I pick on Canova a lot. That's in a... Men of Galilee, they say. Jesus will return the same way you saw him go. Just as Jesus ascended bodily into the cloud, we know he will return bodily from the clouds. You see this in... The, in um, the, pro- the prophet Daniel, he talks about this, the Son of Man riding in the clouds. There's a great camp song about it. But what we see is that this will be a visible return. 
This is a return that will be seen and it will be bodily. And it's not a secret. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that his return would be with a loud trumpet call and with shouts. There's no, there's no secret about when Jesus returns. When he returns, you're going to know. You don't have to worry about missing it. That's a great comfort for us. Jesus' ascension signifies the beginning of his rule over the church as its king. It's a precursor also of our own resurrection and our ascension, or excuse me, our own resurrection and ascension to heaven. On the one hand, we should look to the skies and keep our hope alive. This will protect us from undue worry of involvement in earthly things. Reminds me of Stephen we heard about last week. Remember Stephen? When he, when earthly things were bearing down on him, say it that way, when people were throwing rocks at him, right, to kill him, what's he do? He looks up into heaven. But this, also this message should remind us to not be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. God's word leads us to anticipate our resurrection while we carry on with the work of the Lord here and now. Do you remember what Stephen saw when he looked up to heaven? So the heavens opened to him, and he saw Jesus. And Jesus, I think this is a great picture for us to have in our mind, that Jesus, he wasn't just sitting there. In Acts uh, chapter 7, verse 55, it says Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. Jesus isn't a king who sits back and does nothing. He's, he's a God who, who stands up when trouble is coming to his people. He's a king who reigns and rules even now, who sees you in, in your need. He sees you in your, in your moment of, of distress, and, and he intercedes on our behalf. And there's a couple ways how, specifically how I think this can be a, a great comfort for us. It's so that when we do know we have those sufferings and we have those pains and the distress, we, we have a king who is, is, has all things at his disposal because he is God who understands because he himself suffered. He himself was distressed. He himself was in pain and in torment. He toiled and worked hard. He understands family difficulties he understands broken relationships and he understands your heart in the midst of it. And he has compassion for you. And so when you're hurting or when you're weak or when you're broken, we can look to Jesus because he reigns and rules even now over all things. Another comfort for you as a result of Jesus standing at the throne at the right hand of the Father is that as we go as disciples and we seek to be witnesses to Christ and his death and resurrection, as we seek to, to be witnesses of the gospel, we know that we know the story and we know how it ends. We know that the battle over sin, death, and the devil, the battle against evil is already won. And it's being revealed even now as we hear the word of Christ of his victory upon the cross for you. And as we go and we are witnesses to, to the world, we go with confidence, knowing that our place in heaven, our place in the new earth, and the new Jerusalem is secure. And that those who hear the word of God, this place is also set aside for them and for those who believe. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.